Welcome and thank you for joining us. So I will give it a few seconds for uh, conference delegates to join us in this parallel session number nine, including diverse young women with disabilities. Thank you for joining us. Welcome, welcome. So hello everyone. Uh, bonjour et bon après-midi. My name is Tammy Yates Rajadure, and I'm the Executive Director of Realize, which hosts the National Secretariat of the Episodic Disabilities Forum, and I'm also a member of the National Disability and Work in Canada Conference Steering Committee. My preferred pronouns are she and her. Uh, this is parallel session number nine, including diverse young women with disabilities. Before I hand you over in one minute to Professor Deborah Steenstra, the panel moderator for this interesting session, I'd like to ground us by acknowledging Turtle Island, now referred to as Canada, and the lands on which we may all be situated and from which each of us is joining the conference today. Currently, I am honored to be on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people, now referred to as Ottawa. We pay our respects to the elders of this nation, past, present, and future, and to your ancestors and elders as well. As part of the interactive nature of the conference, there will be a live Q&A session um, after the presentations and Deborah, as the moderator, uh, will uh, be taking your questions and the panelists uh, you know, answering you. And following the presentations and the Q&A session, uh, there will be a networking session from 2.05 to 2.25 p.m. Eastern, specifically designed as an opportunity for delegates to join the discussion and to share your ideas and thoughts. If the conversation has started uh, with the panel presentation in that Q&A, feel free to continue the conversation during the networking session. So to ask a question during the Q&A, you have the option of typing your question in the Zoom Q&A box or in the chat or even raising your hand in Zoom and you will then be unmuted by one of our Zoom admin support staff and be able to ask your question or make your comment. So now it is my profound pleasure to pass the floor to our moderator, Professor Deborah Steenstra. Over to you, Deborah. Thank you, um, Tammy, and it's a pleasure to be here. As Tammy said, I'm Deborah Steenstra. Um, I'm a professor of political science at the University of Guelph. And I'm also, uh, I hold the Jaroslawski Chair in Families and Work. And am in my typical life, the director of the Live Work Well Research Center. And I'm joined on the panel with two other team members that I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Catherine, may I turn it over to you? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Catherine Winder Rinders. I'm a, a white settler woman sitting in my basement, which has a, a panel background and all sorts of kid things on the one side. Um, I have round glasses, uh, long brown hair, and I am wearing a gray sweater with some lace on it. Um, I'm a second year student uh, in the Social Practice and Transformational Change PhD program, um, and I work as a graduate research assistant um, at the Live Work Well Research Center with DEBRA. Um, so that's me, and I will pass over to Yasmin. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Deborah. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Yasmin. It's actually pronounced Yasmin originally from uh, a name originally from Turkey, but everyone calls me Yasmin and no problem with that. My pronouns are she or they, if you're not sure, always go with they. And I'm the Youth Initiatives Coordinator at Dawn Canada. I'm a white woman. I have dark hair. I'm wearing uh, headsets with a little microphone. I have a blue shirt on with white stripes and a black sweater, and my background is blurred to hide all the shameful things going on in the background. 
And um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm also a neurodivergent immigrant, uh, in other words, a settler woman, and I'm very, very happy and honored to be, um, to be here with everyone. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Catherine and uh, Yasemin. And I should give more of a visual description of myself and uh, what I'm coming in as. I also am a white woman, a settler um, from immigrant family. Um, I'm currently in Ottawa at my daughter's house. And you can see beautiful artwork in the background. Um, I wear round uh, red glasses and I'm wearing a burgundy shirt with swirls on it. Um, as I'm coming from Ottawa, I, like Tammy, um, am um, grateful to the um, Algonquin Anishinaabe people for the welcome and um, for their uh, willingness to have us on their traditional unceded territories. And um, I look forward to our discussions today. We are um, uh, first, uh, we're talking today about a project that we've been involved with. Um, that's called Disability and Livelihoods in Canada. We'll first give you an overview of the project, um, of, of the pilot project that we've been involved with. We'll discuss facilitators and barriers to livelihoods choices. Don't worry, we'll tell you what livelihoods mean to us. Um, we'll identify how we're supporting young women with disabilities through knowledge mobilization, including a self-advocacy tool and knowledge briefs. And then we'll spend a little bit of time to tell you where we plan to go from here. Next slide, please. So first then, we're going to introduce you to the Disability and Livelihoods in Canada project. Next slide. So as, probably, as is probably not surprising to the people in this session, people with disabilities in Canada live in the context and around the world, live in the context of limited access to both employment and income. Only 49% of people with disabilities aged 25 to 64 are employed. They, we, are more likely to experience precarious employment such as contract or gig work, working under the table, and we, they, face additional barriers to participation in paid work. As a result, we often re rely on income support to meet the needs of our families, with 70, over 75% of the income of low-income women with disabilities being made up um, by government support. We know that people with disabilities find alternatives to meet their needs, uh, meet the needs of themselves and their families, but we also know that existing responses from policymakers, communities, and academics dominate disability policy discussions. Um, so the Disability and Livelihoods in Canada project responds to this gap in knowledge by working with people with lived experiences. It is a three-year project funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council Partnership Development Grant. Our goals are to examine how livelihoods interact with diverse experiences of disabilities in Canada and develop a strong, practical, and conceptual livelihoods approach to work and families relationship. We've worked through three pilot projects. One is on volunteering, one is on arts and artistry, and the one we'll be talking about today is on young women um, and pre-employment supports. So what do we mean by livelihoods? Livelihoods are the means by which we make a living, which is uh, what most of us put, uh, think about, but it's also the way in which we make a life. So it's not limited to paid employment, and it could include bartering, informal recycling, market gardening, arts, caregiving, and many other things. Livelihoods are shaped by individual experiences, by families and communities. They're shaped by our own sense of well-being. They're also shaped by policies and programs, including pre-employment programs, and they're shaped by crises like COVID or wildfires and floods. So pilot three, which is on young women with disabilities and pre-employment programs, focused on the experiences of diverse young women with disabilities in the Youth the Future program. Our team included the Canadian Council for Rehabilitation and Work, CCRW, Disabled Women's Network of Canada, Dawn Canada, and Live Work Well Research Centre. And 
Um, we had hoped to have a, one of our team members from CCRW on today, but they weren't able to make it. So we're having uh, Catherine and myself from Live Work Well and uh, Yasmin from Dawn Canada. Together, we, connect, we conducted key informant interviews, three focus groups with former YTF participants, a qualitative and quantitative survey, and detailed policy analysis. Next slide. So Yasmin and Catherine will speak about what we learned from our research, first in terms of facilitators and barriers to livelihoods for young women with disabilities. And I'm going to turn it over to Yasmin. Thank you. So, uh, <clears throat> sorry. So when we worked with uh, these youth, uh, these young women with disabilities, young women and gender diverse youth, we asked them what living well meant for them. And they came up with a few answers. Firstly, it meant knowing themselves and their goals. Secondly, finding a work that is in line with these goals and a work that is a type of work that is meaningful, um, that helps the society, that helps to the community, and that is also fulfilling for them. They're also, they also mentioned uh, an environment where they can build themselves, learn. So in other words, not doing work just to be paid, just to pay the bills, but something that helps them grow. And second, uh, and then, I don't know at what number I am now, having people believe in their skills. In other words, having that support system, they're telling them, I believe in you, I believe in the work that you do, continue and being recognized for everything that they can bring to the table and paid accordingly. And finally, access to healthcare, because access to healthcare means being able to, whenever they're in need, they can go and get that help, that medical help, which, uh, which in the end will become, uh, which will help them with their, uh, with the work that they do, with their productivity, with their input, with their output. So that is also very important. Thank you. Next one, please. So um, in all the research that was done, one thing um, uh, stood especially out, that is having a support system. And when we talk about support system, we're talking about three things especially. The support of family and friends, social assistance, and self-support. And in this case, we'll be talking about self-support through self-advocacy. Thank you. Um, what do we do? So I'll, I'll talk about a little bit about the Youth of the Future project. Youth of the Future project is, uh, it has a few uh, branches all over Canada. Dawn Canada was working with CCRW here in Montreal, offering support to uh, young women and gender non-conforming youth with disabilities. Uh, uh, the goal was to help them understand themselves, and go into the employment sector and grow in that sense. So based off the, um, the self-advocacy skills that we worked on, um, I can say that self-advocacy includes knowing yourself and your disability, knowing your values and goals, understanding your disability, and what accommodations you will have to ask for base of these. And self-advocacy in, uh, in the long run means uh, it helps community. How does it do that? Uh, well, once we get to know to un our, once we get to know ourselves, we can start talking about our own experiences. Once we start sharing our own experiences, others can identify with what we're talking about. This is basically peer support. And this in the end, by advocating for ourselves and offering peer support, we will be advocating for the whole community. Thank you. So I'm going to take over from Yasmin um, and talk about 
Um, some of the barriers that our participants um, told us uh, to thriving in their lives. So often our participants told us that their ability to thrive and meet their individual goals or what goals and dreams that they felt were reachable um, were shaped by barriers in their daily lives. Uh, so these barriers included social discrimination, places, spaces, and tools which were not accessible to them, lack of jobs that they felt met their skills and experiences, <clears throat> or a lack of jobs where they felt safe applying to those roles, uncertainty about the future since they did not often know how employment could affect their health, disability, and existing income support or access to services, lack of access to the supports they needed to be able to keep their jobs, or difficulty accessing necessities like stable housing, food, childcare, and reliable transportation to and from work. These barriers combined with other demographic factors to create additional areas of exclusion for people. Um, so as an example, one participant was, on a, one, was unable to stay um, at their job because they lived in a more rural area and couldn't access adapted transit. Um, so be because of that combination of living in a more rural area, and lack of access to transit through unreliable pickup times, they were frequently late and that affected their ability to maintain their employment. Um, similarly, we had other participants who shared with us um, that they experienced gender-based discrimination and lack of safety on public transit. Um, and we had some key informants from the Youth the Future uh, project, or sorry, program, um, who talked about uh, some of the barriers um, to healthcare and that sort of thing that affected YTF participants um, and their ability to manage their, their disabilities. So um, what that kind of means uh, in terms of the broader context of livelihoods is that multiple and overlapping policy areas shape the employment experiences of young women with disabilities. Um, so policy areas that are typically treated as outside of employment, like access to housing and access to transit, will affect the employment options that are available to people. Um, the uh, process of transitioning off income supports can affect access to medical necessities required to maintain employment, such as prescriptions. Um, and then on the workplace side, costs and delays in funding for workplace accommodations can contribute to pre-existing employment discrimination towards people with disabilities. Um, so an example from one of our key informants um, was that one of the issues that they were running into in helping match participants with employment with employers um, is that oftentimes corporate reimbursements for employee accessibility um, from, from the government can take upwards of six months, which can be a barrier to employment. Um, so that kind of brought us to several important lessons for the Disability Inclusion Action Plan. Um, so as many of us know, the federal government announced the Disability Inclusion Action Plan on October 7th. Um, the action plan itself is concerned with financial security, employment, accessible and inclusive communities, and access to federal disability programs. Um, our participants had a lot of feedback through the experiences that they shared with us during the research. And we use this feedback to think through four important lessons um, for actioning the Disability um, Inclusion Access Plan. Um, so the first is that policies need to be responsive to the support needs of diverse people with disabilities. Um, so what that means is that whatever approach the government takes, it needs to recognize that different people with different disabilities are going to need different supports in order to thrive and meet their needs. Um, one of the ways that the government can identify the range of supports which may be needed um, is covered by point two on the slide there, um, including intersectionality and livelihoods frameworks um, to show how policies interact to create disproportionate and unintended policy outcomes. Um, so that means um, kind of including both of those frameworks so that we can see why different people face different barriers in different situations. Um, and it also makes it easier for us to understand why policy areas such as housing, food security, childcare, and poverty reduction. Um, oh, I have a, a typo on my slide. Um, <laughs> shape access to employment, um, which means obviously if we are in crisis, we're having difficulty accessing housing or accessing food, or we cannot find care for our children, it's going to shape our ability to be employed. Um, and it's also going to shape how we meet our livelihoods. 
Um, and then in addition, uh, that can be further compounded again by this point about federal funding for workplace accommodations um, not being easy to access, um, which creates a barrier um, in creating accessible workplaces. So um, we are now going to move into the second part of our presentation um, around supporting diverse young women with disabilities through knowledge mobilization. Um, so Yasmin, I believe you are up first. Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, so um, talking about the self-advocacy, how uh, this youth can talk for themselves, their lived experience. So what we did was uh, we, uh, we listened to their lived experience and took that as a basis for a self-advocacy tool that we created. We took the 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 disability the the experience of these young women and gender diverse youth with disabilities uh, as uh, um, as important contributions and uh, their opinions as experts. And we cooperated with various organizations and uh, brought it all together into in the form of a self-advocacy tool so that we could help others gain this knowledge and share and learn from it. Next one, please. So based on all the information that we gathered, we created a self-advocacy tool. The tool has four modules. The first one is knowing yourself. In other words, what are your dreams? What are your goals? What are your strengths? What are things that you need to work on or that may not be so great for you in the workplace, etc. Second one is knowing your rights and resources. So the tool includes links to various resources, depending on different provinces. And um, it also encourages the participants to look up resources in their own areas to find any information, any support system that they can find, um, that they can locate and add it to the list. The third one is knowing how to express what you need. Because yes, you may know that you have a disability, you may know that you have rights and resources, but if you don't know how to name these, if you don't know what will help with your situation, you cannot express what your needs are. I would like to give an example. For someone who is autistic, Okay, I know myself, let's say this person knows themselves and they need a quiet spot. And then they go to their employer and then they say, I need a quiet spot. But the employer says, it's not possible. We don't have any extra offices. So what's the next thing? By looking up what your, what your rights are, what can help you, you can uh, try to find different solutions. You can ask them for I don't know, uh, noise canceling headphones. And this is just one example. And the last one is building community, peer support, once again. Uh, building community came out as something very important that all participants especially um, went back to. Once uh, all the participants gathered all the information, all the tools that can help elevate themselves, they wanted to start giving back. And the tool is built in such a way that it has clear uh, explanations, descriptions, um, small exercises where it invites the participant to uh, put in the thought and start um, producing the information for themselves. It uses simple language and uh, the, the only thing that needs to be worked on in the future would be uh, something to make it more visually appealing for a greater number of people. And that's it on my end. I'll pass it back to Catherine. All right. Um, so one of the uh, other ways that we use knowledge mobilization to lift up the knowledges of our participants um, was through creating three different types of information documents. Um, so we created a knowledge brief for employers a knowledge brief for organizations and policy briefs for government. So in our knowledge brief for employers, we were able to use the stories um, that were shared to summarize what our, particip what our participants wanted employers to know. Um, so uh, that young women with disabilities want to work and that through integrating accessibility in existing equity, diversity and inclusion strategies, 
focusing on solutions for integrating people with disabilities, and checking in regularly, employers can address many barriers faced by young women with disabilities in the workplace. Um, for organizations, our participants shared four calls to action um, in supporting the livelihoods of young women with disabilities. The first was paying attention to intersectionality. The second was focusing on creating the conditions that make young women with disabilities thrive. The third was continuing to educate parents, educators, and service providers about um, the lives and livelihoods of young women with disabilities. And then the fourth was making space for self-advocacy and community advocacy. Um, and then for government, we created uh, policy briefs which respond to each of the four pillars of the Disability Inclusion Access Plan. Um, and I know we're a little bit short on time and we talked about that earlier in the presentation. So um, if there's any additional questions about that, maybe we can talk about that a bit in the Q&A. Um, so I'm going to pass this back to Deborah on where do we go from here? Great, thank you. Catherine and Yasmin for both, um, for outlining both our research results and our knowledge mobilization work. So we'd like to conclude by sharing a bit about where we anticipate going from here. We're really excited to let you know about a livelihoods forum that we are planning for August, 2023. That's less than a year away. At this three-day hybrid forum, we plan to share results from our and other people's community-engaged research focused on how livelihoods are evident amongst and shape the experiences of diverse people in Canada and around the world. In conjunction with the forum, we're developing an interactive multimedia platform to share the presentations, insights, and other outcomes of the forum widely. The overall goal of this project is to share, discuss, and engage with diverse perspectives, experiences, and knowledges about livelihoods, and to learn from each other about barriers and opportunities for living and working well. We hope if you've got research you want to share that you uh, contact us and let us know. And if you want to participate and learn, uh, contact us as well and let us know. So to contact us, next slide, Catherine. Yeah, you can contact us at the Live Work Well Research Center at liveworkwell at uoakwealth.ca, or you can contact Dawn Canada, and it's yasamin at dawncanada.net.